This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 126, recorded on March 24th, 2011. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today, amazingly, again, across the desk from me, <laughs> is Dixon de Palmier. Hello, Vince. Just like the old days, Dixon. Hey, it is the old days, When Vince. you used to be here all the time, <laughs> and well, then you abandoned us. No, no, no. Am I making you feel bad? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, welcome back, Dixon. Thank you. Good to have you again two weeks in a row. Nice to be here. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Must be sunny there, right? It is. It's briefly sunny. Of course, I'm stuck inside. I, I just just filed my taxes today. Ooh. Oh, come on! It's March. You're well, it's getting to the end of March. You're so efficient. Did you guys get a lot of snow up there? Oh, when? <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no. We just got. Uh, didn't really stick to the roads. We got, got it. Okay. It snowed here. A dusting here yeah. in the day before. Yeah. But now it's sunny, and let's go down to. North Central Florida. Speaking of sunny. Where? Yeah, <laughs> speaking of sunny is right. It's always sunny where we'll find Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How you doing, Rich? I'm doing well. I have a headache, actually, uh -oh. but I'm going to just kind of push past that. When you're through with TWIV, your headache will be gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a palliative for the mind. Good. I'm all set. Yeah, you'll be fine. Today we have a special guest from west of the Mississippi from the University of New Mexico. She's a professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology, Dr. Michelle Osborne. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, good to have you. And we don't often have anyone west of the Mississippi. I've noticed that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Wondering why that is. Um, let's see if I can think of something clever. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> It's no, the time don't. difference. We can't really match up with anyone. Must be. Uh -uh. Yeah. Doesn't work. It's only no. two hours, right? Yeah. So it's one o'clock where you are. We just don't right. know anybody west of the Mississippi. <laughs> oh, well. We're getting to know. We are. That's right. Well, we are an East Coast podcast, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I yeah, we should, broad, we should broaden our horizons, though. Right. We should. Absolutely. I'm just trying to think in recent. So we had Grant. Oh, who's uh, we, had, we had Ela Singh. So she's from Utah, right? Utah, yeah. And we've traveled to California to do one. Does that count? And you're sure. in Montana, right? That's we're in right. Montana. Now, we're going to Minneapolis this summer. Is that west of the Mississippi? Mm, depends um, on which side of the uh, Mississippi yeah. you go on. Oh, it goes right through the state. St. Paul right? is, but I think Minis Minneapolis isn't. Oh, okay. Make sure you've got all your shots before you go. Okay. <laughs> so, Michelle, where are you from originally? Um, I grew up in northwest Colorado. Wow. So not too far from here. And uh, where did this you... This side of the Continental you Divide. Grand on Junction, the west side. Around Grand Junction? Um, it's close to Steamboat. Oh, wow. Yeah. I do a lot of trout fishing, and I've been up through those areas. It's gorgeous. Oh, yeah. It's very nice. Not much science up there, but, you well, know. Steamboat Springs has an annual uh, meeting, though, that's actually quite nice for science, I thought. Yeah, they do. Hmm. So you're happy to be that out there in the West, eh? Yeah, I like it here. It's And the sun shines 360 days a year here. So, <laughs> so is it chilly right now? Um, okay. It's great. I'm wearing flip-flops, and uh. I'm, you know, that's how I gauge how warm it is. I, I think I just remembered why we don't have more West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Uh -huh. yeah, we tolerate jealous. Rich. We're jealous. Right. Yeah, at least with Rich, you know, we can look forward to hurricane season. That's right. Oh, uh, yeah. So, Michelle, tell us a little of your history. Where did you train and grow up? <laughs> you grew up in, in uh, Colorado, but where did you get yeah. your Ph.D.? So I got my PhD at Baylor College of Medicine in uh -huh. Houston oh, and uh, nice. with Janet Butel and Joe Melnick and wow. uh, all of those guys. So, And then I went to um, central Pennsylvania where I did a postdoc with Craig Myers mm -hmm. uh, working on papillomaviruses. That's Penn State? Penn State, Hershey, mm -hmm. yep. Oh, yeah. Well, I used to know Joe Melnick from polio days. I met him at some meetings years ago. Um, and I yeah, saw... he was an interesting guy. Very interesting. And I saw Janet Butel just a few weeks ago. She's on the study section again. Yeah. And uh, she's still going strong there. 
She is. Cool. Great training. And then after your postdoc, you went to Albuquerque. Came here, yeah. So you've been there so, how long? 13 years. Home of the balloon fiesta. Oh, the balloon fiesta is fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's absolutely great. It's, yeah. Great sales pitch for recruiting people here. <laughs> when I talked to you uh, yesterday, so we had the video running on Skype, and there's a print on your office wall. It says um, Taos. I, I could see just the big letter Taos, right. which isn't too far from you. And you told me it's from a papillomavirus workshop, and it's a it picture is. of tissue sections. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> from mouse xenografts showing HPV RNA levels in viral DNA. That's right. It's a huge poster, right? It is a big poster. Yeah, and it's, it's cool. a good teaching mechanism, but it's totally nerdy. <laughs> that's great. Well, we're all about nerdiness here. Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, HPV human papillomavirus is what we're going to talk about, because that's what you work on, right? Right. Did you do that as, as a postdoc? I, you just told me, but I forgot. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I actually did. So I went to Craig Meyer's lab. He was a brand new assistant professor, and he had just... Um, published using um, the organotypic or raft tissue culture for um, propagation or biosynthesis of virions. So I wanted to get into the real virology of hmm. of stuff. So it was, you know, the, the beginning of being able to study virus infections with HPV. So I wanted to have a pretty broad discussion about HPV because we haven't really talked about it on TWIV. And so let's start at the beginning. Now, HPV is involved in or causes genital cancers of various sorts. So when, I mean, we, we've been aware of those kinds of cancers for many years, but when did we start thinking it might be an infectious disease, do you know? Well, so, you know, papillomaviruses cause all different kinds of warts, and we've known that the cutaneous warts were caused by viruses as early as the turn of the century, the, the into the um, the 19th century. So a long time we've known about that. But um, then it was in the 80s when we started thinking about papillomaviruses causing um, anogenital cancers and cervical cancer specifically. So a big gap from looking at some kinds of virus infections, cutaneous infections, to um, understanding cancer. So uh, what, aside from HPV, which hadn't yet been discovered, what other human papillomaviruses did we know about? So mostly about hand and foot warts. Okay. So those have long been characterized and, and then discovered as sort of um, self-free filtrates, so known as infectious agents and then um, characterized as viruses. Um, and, and actually, Joe Melnick was one of was the first lab to do EM to show that what these virus particles looked like. Mm -hmm. It's kind and, of cool. Are those polyomaviruses? Papillomaviruses. Papil papillomas, but the the word was uh, was in use already at the time, right? Well, so originally the viruses were grouped into Papova viridae, which right. is the family joint with the um, polyomaviruses, and and now they're separated. Right. Um, right. I remember that. So it, all the papillomaviruses are wart-causing viruses. Okay. The the papova viruses and the papillomaviruses look the same, and they both have circular DNA genomes. So right. uh, so it's understandable that they were confused to start with. Right, and because we couldn't grow papillomaviruses in the laboratory, you know, in beginning in the fifties and stuff when we started being able to do cell culture, mm. um, we just b went on viral DNA and what it looked like. Yeah. How so, many different kinds of warts are there? So there <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I've had them on my hands, so I'm curious. Lots. Oh, you know, people tell me all kinds of things about their warts that I don't really want to know. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go into <laughs> details here. <laughs> um, so there are there are basically any place that you have epithelium on your body, you can end up getting a wart practically. And so um, there are over 126 or so. That seems really specific, but so 126 characterized genomes. Wow. Um, probably over 200 of them that that are in existence, and it looks like we're just sort of covered with the viruses. We live with them, and most of the time they're asymptomatic and um, subclinical, and sometimes um, they flare up. So. So they're always on us. Th it looks like they're always on us. Everybody has these. 
Yeah. So wow. everybody's covered with them. The, people have done studies like plucking eyebrow hairs and looking for DNA. And just like you think that you're covered with bacteria, <laughs> you're covered with these viruses. I'll too. So, they, so why don't more of us get warts then? Um, because I think that our cell mediated immune system keeps them in check. Okay. And so, also how do, I mean, these are, they're, if they're just sitting on the skin surface, um, how, how do they stick around? Mm. Well, so you're sort of getting into the life cycle of the virus and, and, and whether, you know, I don't know exactly, we can't say exactly what it means to detect the DNA on the skin surface, um, or, or virus particles on the skin surface. But the idea is that the viruses, um, infect the basal layer of the epithelium, which is the lowest layer of the skin. And usually they stay sort of below the radar, but when your skin is shed, you shed viruses. And right. so we, you know, we may be shedding these all the time. Um, they're probably not just sitting on the surface of our skin per se, but, you know, we may have low level infectious virion production. Hmm. So how were the human papillomaviruses discovered? Um, how were the human papillomaviruses discovered? So um, I, Originally, the, the data came from grinding up hand warts and foot warts, which make, as you know, if you've had one, they make pretty big warts, and you can actually get a lot of virus out of them. Um, and so that was um, the original HPV1, HPV2 came from mm -hmm. uh, from planter warts and from common warts. Um, and then with the advent of DNA technology, um, and molecular cloning, we started realizing that there were more and more genotypes of these warts. Um, and then Zurhausen's group started finding these new genotypes, like 16 and 18, in cervical cancers, and that was really the breakthrough discovery there. So the other serotypes had already been known when Zurhausen made his discovery. That's correct. So they they were named, you know, sequentially. So one, two, three, and so by the time he got to sixteen and eighteen, those ended up being the ones that they d discovered um, in a number of cervical cancers. Um, then that w that was basically the, mm. the observation there. And of course, for that, he got the Nobel Prize. He did not, not yeah. too many years ago, actually, along with uh, the discoverers of HIV, I believe. That's correct, yeah. yeah. So he initially found, so he was looking at genital warts. He found 16 and 18, did you say? That's correct, yeah. And so then how long after he initially found them, what, was it generally accepted that these two serotypes were uh, causing cancers? So I, you know, I came into the papillomavirus field in about 94, and it was pretty well accepted then. His initial discoveries were in the mid-80s, and, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of controversy for a while because people were unsure of whether it was herpes simplex virus or, um, you know, some other infectious agents. And, and the issue is, you know, when you have one sexually transmitted disease, you often have others, and so it was that was a bit hard to sort out. So I would say, you know towards the late 80s, early 90s, that it, that it became much more clear. And then the epidemiology certainly filled that in. And, and cervical cancer is, is one of the cancers, is, is the main cancer that is known to have almost a completely singular etiology in infection of, with HPV. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like 99.9% .9 of cervical cancers have HPV. Wow. So making the association has the common problem with a, a human uh, disease of, you know, you can make a correlation. You can't do the experiments to satisfy uh, Cox postulates. Okay? You can't infect humans with the agent and uh, reproduce the disease. It's all about correlation. And ultimately, in the case of the papillomaviruses, you also un uh, we also uncovered a mechanism which made it clearer as well, which really helped seal the deal. That's right. Yeah, and and certainly early on, you know, in the 1920s, people were taking common warts and reinfecting people with them and showing that they could get warts out of them. But we're not really allowed to do that anymore, I don't no. think. <laughs> we now, do it inadvertently when... Exactly. Yeah. One of the outcomes of Zerhausen's finding is that you can now look for type 16 and 18. You can screen populations. Is that done now to know if someone is infected? 
It is. And and so it's sort of in combination with the pap smear, which mm-hmm. is, is really looking for cytopathic effect of the virus. Um, and that was instituted before we even knew that papillomavirus was what we were looking at. Um, but now um, it's, it's fairly common to use HPV um, nucleic acid tests to type the viruses and see, you know, if uh, more follow-up is needed and, and sort of whether people have high-risk types, which are the types that are more um, apt to progress to malignancy, or if they have types that generally don't progress to mm. malignancy. I just read a great history of the pap smear in this book, um, The Emperor of All Maladies, which is a history of cancer written by a, an oncologist here at uh. Columbia, actually. And I didn't know anything about the history of, of Pap, who, whose name was actually a longer Greek, Greek name. Papa Pap- Nicolau. or something like Pap- that. Papa Nicolau. There's, a, there's a, um, a, lo- a, like a meeting room or a lecture hall named after him at, um, I think, Sloan Kettering, isn't there? Uh, Columbia. Uh, sorry, Cornell. Cornell, yeah. Yeah, that's where he yeah, I remember yeah. we, we used to go to like the, the monthly virology meetings in New York. We were occasionally held there. <laughs> yeah, it's really amazing how he stumbled on this. And for years, no one believed him. And he languished. And it was thir- 20 or 30 years after he developed this that they did some large-scale tests to validate them. So how does it work now? Do you have a pap smear? And then if that's abnormal, you would have a screening for HPV, or are they both done at the same time? Oh, wow, you're getting me into the clinical realm, you know, and I'm a really basic scientist. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I'm just, but, I'm just curious. But I, I mean, typically women go and have pap smears, and, and um, I don't exactly know the answer to what you're saying other sure. than by my own experience and, and maybe... Um, you know, talking to some of my more clinically um, sure. um, related people. But um, basically, if you have an abnormal pap smear, um, they will tend to do more testing and see, you know, what the follow-up should be on it. Do you know what age that begins at? Is it puberty, basically? It's supposed to begin with um, with sexual activity. I okay. mean, that's basically what the recommendation is. Right. And is is this the only cause of cervical cancer, or are there other causes also? So, so HPV is linked to ninety nine point nine percent of cervical cancer. So that's it's incredible. The, yeah, it's the tightest um, correlation of an infectious agent with a cancer that we. And have. I've heard, I've heard people say, yeah, linked to ninety nine point nine, and the other point one percent probably <laughs> HPV too. Yeah, I mean, we we actually have a couple of cervical cancer cell lines that are HPV negative. Mm. So, I mean, there may be some other really low level um, causative agent, but um, it's amazing. It's pretty small. So, when you're born, you're negative for sixteen type sixteen and eighteen, and then you acquire it by sexual activity. That that's the the basic premise. I mean, so and, and the reason I say that and I put that caveat on it is that there are two types, HPV six and HPV eleven, which cause um, genital warts, and the process of birth is linked to so so passage through the birth canal. If the mother is infected with these, right. can infect the child, yes. and and often that's. Um, it's most often um, correlated with with um, um, respiratory papillomatosis, which is is not a malignancy, but it's a very life threatening disease mm-hmm. um, because it just blocks the airway. So, um, and there are some some reports that children even receive this if they are um, birthed under cesarean section. So, you know, we don't really understand that so well. But but typically, it's thought. 16 and 18 are thought to be sexually transmitted diseases. Whether they're only sexually transmitted is, you know, mm-hmm. something that hasn't been proven, I guess. Well, Michelle, there's another disease that uh, in women, and you're probably very familiar with it, called Trichomonas vaginalis, which can be transmitted to the, uh, to the newborn, uh, only in female patients. And it is a vaginal infection in the female patients. And it just lies dormant for many years, and then all of a sudden it comes up as, as puberty occurs. So it's possible that the papillomavirus gets involved in that way too. 
It could be. And and I've seen studies where they've looked at young children, you know, and, and seen cases where they are also positive for this, you know, and then there's always the question of were they, were they sexually abused right. or what is it? And, right, right. and you know, I, I'm sure that they're... I mean, it makes sense to me that children could get it by passage through the birth canal as well. I mean, because the virus is there. Maybe somebody should go and do this at a convent. Well, so it's interesting that you say that because that's really how we started understanding that cervical cancer was a sexually transmitted disease. Because the observation was that that prostitutes um, had very high incidences of cervical cancer and nuns never had it right so um yeah good population to study yeah yeah exactly. Exactly. that's great so uh uh let's talk about mechanism how do they do this how do they cause cervical cancer so there are two main oncoproteins e6 and e7 and they, like the oncoproteins of a number of other DNA tumor viruses, like adenoviruses and, um, and polyomaviruses, bind up P53 and RB and, and make them inactive. So these are key tumor suppressor proteins. Um, and the viruses probably do this to keep the cells in cell cycle mode so that they can make more viral genomes and express their proteins. And this just becomes unbalanced. That's in, in cervical cancer, where the virus may be pushing the cell to replicate too much mm -hmm. instead of differentiating. And um, in a small proportion of, of cases, then you get more DNA damage. You know, if you don't have P53, they're checking it, and you progress. You get but, cells that are out of control. But now, is it, uh, is it not true that in the majority of these, the viral DNA actually becomes integrated into the cellular DNA, so it's now fixed permanently in this condition? Well, so that has always been a long-held tenet of um, progression to malignancy. But there are a lot of data that have come out in the past five or ten years that suggest that... Um, in differing proportions, depending on which HPV type 16 or 18 that you're looking at that's the cause of the cervical cancer, that you can have a lot of episomal-only um, cancers, or you can have episomal and integrated mixed. So the episomal genome being separate from the, the, the host cell genome, it replicates freely on its own. Um, and, and we don't really understand that other than maybe that the, the viral genomes are differentially methylated or something so that the, the key really is overexpression of E6 and E7. And that may happen by integration or it may be happening by differentially regulating episomal viral genomes. So okay. you don't have to have integration to get cancer. Okay, so uh, uh, you're going to cause me to change all my lectures. So the... A lot of people still in the papillomavirus field say that this is a necessary event, and well, the data don't support that anymore. So, are they okay. graduates of the University of Florida? Ah, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them definitely are. <laughs> now you so, know why we never go so, west of the so Mississippi. The, so the, the, the dogma that I have heard is really twofold. First of all, that the integration event um, winds up not only fixing expression of these, but stimulating them because you're, the integration often happens through the E2 regulatory protein. So that uh, has a, the viral E2 regulatory protein. So that uh, upregulates E6 and E7, number one. And number two, I have been told, at least anecdotally, that when it's episomal, lots of times the E2 protein is mutant in those viruses. Is that too simple an explanation now? No, that's probably correct. And um, it, and it just goes back to the overlying theme, which is overexpression of E6 and E7, or okay. higher expression. Because those things <clears throat> do seem to correlate very tightly with cervical cancer, that you, that you have to have that um, sustained expression. And so, you know, there have been some labs that have done some really elegant um, 
work knocking down E6 and E7 in HeLa cells, for example, or, or other cells that have HPV in them, and show that those cells then senesce. So that's really, E6 and E7 expression are really important for maintaining that transformed phenotype. Okay, so given that E6 and E7 are important, uh, what is it that makes HPV 16 and 18 particularly nasty? Because all of these uh, papillomaviruses have these oncoproteins, right? That's correct. And, and so the defining feature of a high-risk virus, which is the, the ones that, that tend to cause cancer, are that their E6 and E7 can bind more tightly to P53 and RB and sequester them and inactivate mm -hmm. them, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, and I believe also that, um, you know, E6 and E7 do a lot of things besides just binding to E6, to binding to P53 and RB, and they bind to a lot of other um, proteins in the cell as well, um, like all good tumor um, proteins do. And um, so E6 of high-risk viruses also bind to um, PDZ binding domain proteins, and they activate telomerase better than their low-risk um, E6 counterparts and, and things of that nature. So they're much better at keeping the cells in cell cycle mode and in replication mode than the low-risk viruses are. So the low-risk viruses can't really immortalize cells or transform cells because of okay. that. What's the basic difference then between the basal cells in the skin and the cervical epithelium in terms of transformation? So, you know, we don't, there's a lot that we don't know, and that's one of the, the focal points of my lab is trying to understand the anatomy of infection in the genital tract. So, so the cervical area is, is kind of interesting because there the cervix is composed of two different types of cells, endocervix, which is really just a, a simple epithelium, and the ectocervix, which is a stratified epithelium. Mm -hmm. And there's a zone in between those two um, types of cells called the transformation zone um, or the transition zone, and that's generally where cervical cancers arise. Mm -hmm. And and part of the, the idea behind why that is is because those cells are sort of metaplastic anyway they're they're dividing and and proliferating and so they're probably more susceptible maybe not to virus infection but to virus transformation so so we see more cervical cancers sort of at that differentiating zone there so are there uh, cell lines that are non-permissive and other cell lines that are permissive in terms of this uh, cervical cancer causing papillomavirus or or can you infect them all with it and it's just an in vivo thing that's uh, different um so that question is is actually sort of a complicated question so there are a couple of levels to permissivity um one is you can infect cells in in culture in monolayer cultures and they are susceptible to early infection, but they're not permissive to the full virus life cycle because they don't differentiate. And you have to get the cells differentiating completely in order to make new viruses. And do those cells then lose their contact inhibition and pile up on top of each other or not? They don't tend just by being infected with the virus or being transfected with viral genomes to pile up on one another, but they do they do become more crowded mm -hmm. um, and and um, you know they have higher growth potential they they will be in s phase more um, and and do a lot of that um, but so uh, then there's the permissivity issue I guess that that is linked to um, what types of skin are more susceptible to infection and more permissive to the different HPV types? So you can't get, I mean, it's, it's, you don't typically get cutaneous lesions from HPV 16 and 18. Right, right, right. Could you explain for, for some of the listeners who don't know what P53 and RB are and right. how, how E6 and E7 interfere with their function? Sure. So, um, P53 and RB are our main tumor suppressor proteins in the cell, and that means basically that they keep the cell in check and don't let the cell um, uh, synthesize DNA and divide too much. And they also sense if there's DNA damage and they prevent the cell from replicating its, uh, vir its genome um, 
so that it would um, um, pass that damage on to new daughter cells. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these DNA tumor viruses target these, um, these proteins because the proteins actually get activated by by viral proteins, and it's a it's a cell mechanism for for really trying to prevent virus infection. Probably, so the viruses target these proteins to try to keep them at, at check so that the virus can can replicate its viral DNA and sort of take over the cell. So when now, you- it seems like. <clears throat> Some of the some of the papillomaviruses have worked out a, a nice friendly arrangement with warts. I mean, HPV one, HPV two, um, fairly benign generally, and they've got their particular affinity for PP fifty three and RB. Um, whereas HPV sixteen and eighteen um, can go on to to develop uh, tumors. If you look at a phylogenetic tree of these, are HPV 16 and 18 likely to be to have more recently come into humans, or is there some selective pressure that actually selects for uh, tumorigenesis? Oh, that's a good question. Aren't I don't you glad know you that... came on the show, Michelle? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I can answer that, and and I'm sure that there are people that that can. I, I mean, these are viruses that have evolved with humans for millions of years, so they've been with us for a really long time, and they have their own. Each of the viruses have their own little. Um, skin niche, if you will. They infect different parts of the body, and, and that's where they're good at, at staying around and, and being shed and being transmitted to other people. Um, and they certainly do genetically group into different um, genera in the papillomavirus family. Um, but as far as I know, there's not an idea that some viruses have been with us longer or a shorter period of time. Because I would think, I mean, evolutionarily, the best arrangement for HPV 16 or 18 would be to just, you know, silently produce cervical, maybe small cervical warts and get transmitted and, and spread around like the the warts on fingers and toes, um, as opposed to, you know, occasionally killing the patient. Right. And, and that's a really good point because these viruses are very transmissible. So the the statistics say that a sexually active person has an 80% chance of becoming infected with one of these viruses, one of these genital types during their lifetime. So almost everybody will get infected, but not very many people will get an infection that will cause a malignancy. And we know that men are also infected with the viruses, but they don't they rarely get um, penile cancers. They, it does happen, but it's much more rare. And so you have a situation where there's definitely genital epithelium that's infected that's very permissive for the virus. It's permissive for for the full virus life cycle and for transmission to new people, but it doesn't cause cancer. And so the important thing, I think, to point out about these viruses that are called tumor viruses is they don't mean to cause cancer. It's not in their best <laughs> it's not in their best interest to cause cancer. And and you know, I don't mean to personify them by doing that. Um although I do think of them as kind of evil at times. <laughs> Um, but but it's not in the virus's best interest to cause cancer because usually when you get progression of that nature, the cells can't differentiate enough to make more virus particles and get spread. So it's it's a bad byproduct of infection, and and I that's probably why it doesn't happen so much because you know you don't want to kill your host off too soon if you're a smart virus. <laughs> right. So it, it, it may be that we've we've already reached the evolutionary equilibrium here where the the virus is as non-pathogenic as it can be while still spreading right in the the case of the uh transformations that are caused by the integration once the integration happens the virology is over anyway that's not really talking about a virus infection anymore Mm -hmm. and it's a Mm -hmm. it's a very it's a very small very small fraction of the infections that uh ultimately yield a tumor correct that's correct. Yeah. And and there's also a very long latency. We're talking about like 10 years or so from the initial infection to to uh, a tumor. Is that correct? Exactly. And and that's an important point too from the aspect that 
what we call this is the virus is necessary, but it's not sufficient for making a tumor. Right. So what that means is we think that the virus is, is important for initiation. It's the first event in what could go, could, could, could progress to malignancy, but a lot of other things have to happen too. And so, so basically, if the virus is getting in, it's expressing E6 and E7 and downregulating the functions of P53 and RB, the cell has the potential to get other mutations that in some cases might give the cells more mm. of a growth advantage oh, right. and put them on that path where we know that cancer is a multi-step process. It's not just one or two changes, but it's, you know, a whole slew of changes that you have to get where that cell gets a growth advantage in the host. And yeah, we say like you need six or seven mutations to make a cancer cell. So by stimulating the cells to divide, those are accumulating. So the virus needs a division to multiply its genome, but in, in the process, the cell is undergoing mutation and therefore it becomes transformed at some point. Is that a fair... Yeah, summary. that's that's exactly right. So I wonder if you could tell us, go back to the cervical epithelium and tell us when the virus first infects, which cells are infected, and then as the infection progresses, what happens as we go all the way to, to cancer? So that's something that we really don't know. I mean, we don't know in the female genital tract which cells are are susceptible to infection because what we do when we screen is we look at the cells that are susceptible to transformation. And that's what the pap smear does. It samples those cells in that transitional zone to see if there are cells that show signs of virus infection. It doesn't tell you what other cells in that environment are infected. And, and there is certainly evidence that the vaginal epithelium is susceptible. And so you may have fully permissive infections going on in the vagina, in the cervix, um, in the endocervix, in the ectocervix that that are just making more virus and, and certainly helping this virus to be transmissible. And from a clinical standpoint, we don't really care about that because it's not causing any disease in, in patients. And, you know, it's kind of like hand warts. I mean, we know that they're caused by a virus. Um, we don't know a lot about them because they don't cause a huge amount of of morbidity um, in our population that really drives us to need to treat them more than we already can. So, so in the genital tract, I think that there are a lot of cells probably infected. Um, the question is, you know, what happens and why do some of these transformation zone or transition zone cells get infected and and what happens to them you know are they already in a highly prol proliferative state so they're more susceptible to p53 and rb getting further down regulated and and that's the non permissive um, environment that you need to to set set everything in motion to get a cancer so let me just follow up on that, please, to, to clarify something in my own mind. Are we looking at an interaction between E6 and E7 with uh, P53 and RB, or is it a uh, an indirect effect? So, I, what I think that you're asking is, do those part do those cell do those viral proteins bind Correct. directly to those? Yeah. And so, um, in the case of P53. Um, E6 uses um, a bridge protein called E6 associated protein because mm -hmm. it wasn't known to have any other functions to bridge that interaction. Okay. And E7 can bind directly to um, the retinoblastoma susceptibility. So then my other question after that would be then, why doesn't the host cell uh, sense the loss of V53 and, and RB and make more of it and overwhelm the viral's ability to sequester the excess protein? So I think that the cell tries to do that actually. So if if there's a um a not a good balance of E6 and E7 being made. So if you for example just express E7, what happens is the the P53 as the guardian of the genome as right. it's been called yep. um becomes alerted and you get really high expression of p53 in the absence of e6 right. and so it's kind of the way that the virus has evolved to um 
to hold those balancing um, uh, levels that the that the cell has and and keep those in check for itself. So, and, and this is also known for adenoviruses and and for um, polyomaviruses, the same sort of thing. So, if if you just take one of those proteins away, the other side of of the cell checkpoint is is activated. So you have to have um, um, up upregulated S phase and the prevention of apoptosis that happens um, because otherwise the cell will commit suicide. While we were uh, thinking about this episode, an, an article came out just last month in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology. It's an article about diagnostic testing for uh, HPVs. And they say in this article that if you look for E6, E7 um, expression, it's more predictive of cervical cancer than just looking for viral DNA, which I guess is what they look for in, a, in some kind of PCR test or capture. Right. Uh, so why would that be? Well, I think it's it's really falls into exactly what we've been talking about is, you know, if the DNA is there, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have um, high expression of E6 and E7. And, and we know that expression of E6 and E7 and the levels of E6 and E7 are really what um, seem to be the driving mm-hmm. force in in um, progressing to malignancy, and so I, I think that this is a really um, interesting study and and advantageous in looking at the messenger RNA for these these two um, oncoproteins because it does seem it, it logically with everything that we've been discussing um, makes sense that 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 would be more predictive of outcome of cervical mm-hmm. cancer. I think maybe the reason that it that it hasn't been used in the past is is it's it's more difficult to detect messenger RNA and certainly more difficult to detect the messenger RNA of E6 and E7. I mean, these viruses are really good at staying under the radar. So certainly if you can detect E6 and E7, um, that means that they're at a level, um, you know, that needs to be watched more mm-hmm. carefully in a lesion. So if you do have a positive DNA test for HPV, what, what do you do? Um, you mean clinically what happens? Yeah. So... Even in the absence of a positive test, but let's say that you're t- you're you're positive for HPV 16 or 18, and you have an abnormal Pap smear that shows. So so Pap smears um, are are graded um, differently, sort of depending on the cyto- cytopathology. So you have low grade um, intraepithelial lesions, and you can have high grade um, intraepithelial lesions, and um, Basically, the clinicians, I believe, um, suggest that that um, if you have a if you have a high risk type and a low grade lesion, that you have some form of treatment, and that can involve um, it might just involve um, watching it and taking a biopsy and coming back for a three month Pap smear um, follow up, or it might involve freezing the cervix right. or you know laser of the cervix and and various treatments of that nature. Okay. Okay. So at the, at the minimum, you have to be um, more actively screened than you would normally. Right. And the screening has been very effective in the United States for preventing cancer. I mean, we don't have a lot of cervical cancer, but it's very costly for us. And that's part of the reason the vaccine was, um, you know, invented. So the, vac- um, the vaccine was made to prevent the costly but rarer cancers then? Well, I can't tell you exactly the, the reasoning behind who, why they decided to make it. I mean, you know, we're basic scientists. We decide that we want to prevent infection. But the, but the key was, yes, to prevent infection with these viruses and then prevent the cancer um, that's caused by them. And, and there's very good precedent for this from looking at animal studies of cottontail rabbit papillomavirus and um, canine oral papillomavirus that told us that these things could be effective in this realm. Mm-hmm. So the vaccine- now there, there are actually two vaccines out at this right. point, right? That's correct. <clears throat> and they differ. They do. Um, so the first vaccine, um, if I recall my my um, 
my pr- vaccine producers correctly, the first vaccine that was um, FDA approved um, here was from Merck, and it's um, it's a quadrivalent vaccine, which means that it has four HPV types. It has HPV 16 and 18 that cause cervical cancer, and it has HPV 6 and 11 that cause genital warts. And then there's a Gardasil vaccine that has just HPV 16 and um, and HPV 18 in them. This is reversed. Right. right. Gardasil is, it, is the quad. They're is all it? virus-like particles, right? All See, I was just reading about yeah, adverse <laughs> reactions, and then I was getting all confused. Okay. So, yeah. So why why the 6 and 11 was included? I think the reason for including it was to make it... Um, the idea was to decrease the cost and, and morbidity from just having people have genital warts because mm-hmm. we spend a lot of money I treating see. that. So, um, you know, to make it more cost effective overall as a sexually transmitted infection um, preventative. So do we know the impact on cervical cancers yet from using these vaccines? I'm not sure that you can that you can go all the way to cancer because the vaccines have only been um, five or six year follow up. And yeah, as we yeah. talked before, it's, you know, a long sometimes 10, 15, 20 years before you get cancer. But we know that this is a highly um, efficacious vaccine for preventing the low grade and medium grade lesions that are high grade lesions that that are indicative of progression to malignancy hmm. and 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 the the protection has really been um amazing i mean this is a really good vaccine so this is a injected vaccine which i know because i watched my kids my three kids all get it and so i'm amazed that the injection gives you mucosal protection in the cervix or penis to prevent infection Right. Yeah. I think, I mean, I I think that that was an original um, question as to how much protection you would get and how long lived it would be. And we don't still know the answers to that. Um, And certainly people are working on other sort of mucosal delivery um, that may, um, you know, be better. But at this point, it seems very effective to do the, the subcutaneous Injection. Well, does it do they actually induce mucosal immunity, or is it just that um, HPV, uh, because it's replicating further down in these in these uh, epithelia, it's actually exposed to the bloodborne immunity? Well, the, I think the evidence is that there is mucosal immunity. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, what is the uh, nature of the immune response to HPV infections under normal circumstances? You don't make a lot of antibody, do you? That's correct, and that's that's been a really a, a big difficulty is that, you know, only a fraction of the people that we know have been infected mount an immune response, and and that was a question of you know well how will we measure if the vaccine is is going to be effective if we don't even know what a good immune response should be. Um, and we know that that um, you know the immune response can wane, and we see sometimes that people get reinfected or or maybe they reactivate or something um but we don't know a lot about the immune response and and why sometimes it's activated in people that are infected and sometimes it's not is there a is there a cellular response that's important in uh, in the infection so there's a cellular um response cd4 and cd8 cells are really um, important for keeping the infections in check. And so, for example, when you have warts that are regressing, they can see an infiltrate of these cells um, in that area. And we certainly know that people who have um, immunocompromising situations, especially people who have AIDS, have much higher um, genital warts, hand warts, and and you can see that, you know, their, their body's lack of that part Part of their immune arm is really important in keeping these um, virus infections in check. Now, if somebody who already has um, HPV 16 or 18 is vaccinated, do you stimulate a cellular immune response against it? If they're already if they're already infected, and then you vaccinate right. them. Um, not that I know of, and you know, the vaccine is not recommended for people who are already infected because. Right. Uh, and and honestly, I don't know if people have looked at that. I, I don't think that that is true because the vaccine is really just stimulating an antibody response. Right. Okay. 
when they originally tested the vaccine, I presume they had a immunized and a controlled population, and they looked to, at, at seroconversion, I would guess, mm -hmm. and right. saw if the vaccine prevented... No, that wouldn't make sense because you're going to seroconvert. So what did they look at in the vaccine trial? Because th they can't look for prevention of cancer because that's 10 years down the line, right? Well, I mean, from the animal studies that they had done, they could look at, to see if there were warts. Mm -hmm. And so those were those were very um, promising in that regard. Um, so you're asking in the in, people, what did mm -hmm. we look at to see? So we look to see if they ever get DNA positive. I see. So okay. you follow them to see, you know, over time they're going to be exposed. So do they have DNA and and will they have abnormal pap smears? Okay. And and that's really um, the the cue that this is a highly effective vaccine is that we've had no breakthrough infections in the populations who've been vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So the, the sense that I get is that, uh, just, I'm just trying this out, tell me if this sounds right, that the normal immune response to a papillomavirus infection does not necessarily involve a robust antibody response, maybe uh, both arms or mostly cellular, and yet the vaccine immunity that we're inducing is a, mostly an antibody response. So, so it's as if the immunization is working like in a di mechanistically differently than uh, the natural immunity. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, it, this is complicated by the fact that we don't really understand mechanistically and at the molecular level how the viruses infect. So if you think about it from a skin perspective, you know, our our skin is our is the largest organ in our body and it's and it's there to protect us and keep the bad things out and keep the good stuff in and and that's the function that it that it gives the body. And so for these viruses to get in and pass that barrier and get to the basal cells of the epithelium, we think that there needs to be a wound in the epithelium. And and we certainly know that in the cases that there are wounds, that that potentiates infection. We don't know the mechanisms of why um, wounding is important, and that's something that we're looking at in my laboratory. Um, but the idea is... is the obvious idea is that the virus gets access to the basal cell layer. So, so if you have that, you probably, if you have this small wound, you probably could have serum into that area, and that would be potentially where your immune response would kick in and neutralize the virus before it got into the cells. Um, but then during, <clears throat> during infection, in a natural infection, um, where you don't have an, an a pre-existing antibody response, it, the virus can get in and it, it is immediately goes below the radar of 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 the animal. And so, you know, there there's not a lot of immune surveillance in the epithelium. There are some dendritic cells, but the virus really doesn't express many of its proteins until it gets to the outer layers where it's going to start assembling new virus particles and there's and there's little immune surveillance in that area so it doesn't so in a natural infection there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of places where you would see enough capsid protein expression that would be um, sensed by the immune system to make a, a, an antibody response in a natural infection what was the logic of extending immunization initially in females now to males well, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure about how the CDC looked at it. And, and part of it, part of the reason they didn't want to look at it initially was that it wasn't a cost. It, it didn't provide any cost benefit to them, as I understand it. Um, but the issue really is that males are really thought to be the vectors of the disease. So that's how, that's how these, these anogenital papillomaviruses get get transmitted. Yeah. I sort of think of them kind of like mosquitoes. Great. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, um, so I think the issue, and you know, I have a six-year-old son and I will definitely have him immunized because I think that as a responsible person, you don't want to transmit a disease that may not harm you to somebody else. Um, and so, 
you know, it was sort of a cost benefit. And it's also more difficult because, I mean, we don't have um, good testing and men don't usually get tested. When we do test them, we can tell that they're positive. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the reason that we know, but, but there's no overt um, disease that's commonly, um, you know, that clinicians commonly see. I mean, you know, people probably have genital warts, but maybe they're untreated or... Well, and I guess that would kind of make Gardasil uh, at least an easier sell um, for vaccinating boys as well as girls, because it does also prevent many of the cases of genital warts that would show up. Exactly. Right. So, Michelle, uh, tell us what your burning questions of basic research on this virus are. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so I'm really interested in understanding why, um, what happens when you get uh, a wound and how that wounded environment really um, potentiates infection and, and what are the molecular mechanisms at play. So, yeah, it makes sense that you would have access to the basal layer, but we know that there are lots of things that change in a wound and do those things make it um, more easy for the virus or has the virus evolved to use those mechanisms um, to make itself more infectable, if, if you will, or make the cells more effectable. Right. So, so you get a transition and then the epithelial cells turn into a more mesenchymal type of, of infection. Uh, it, sorry, a more mesenchymal phenotype of the cells. And, and we're trying to understand, you know, whether that um, is important for the virus infection. Do you have a big, an epidemiologic uh, basis for that? For instance, do day laborers and masons laborers and bricklayers and those kinds of people have a higher incidence of uh, foot and hand warts than people that don't do uh, manual labor? You know, I haven't thought about it from the standpoint of those more cutaneous warts. Um, and, oh, okay. and there isn't really good epidemiological evidence e either i mean people you know this is one of those dogma things where people say yeah, in yeah. fact that's you right. know you have to have a break in the epithelium or a micro wound and that's how the virus gets in well we don't know that and we know that the virus can activate philopodia which are these little protrusions sure. from the cell yep. and those might reach up through the epithelium and grab virus particles so <laughs> i mean we, you know we're we're trying to understand what it is about um that process that might make infection more efficient. And part of the reason that that we kind of got interested in it from just a basic science standpoint is when we do infections in the lab, they're awful. I mean, the efficiency is really lousy and we get only a few cells infected. And we kept thinking to ourselves, you know, in vivo, these viruses are highly infectious. Why do we not see this in our models? There must be something about our models that are wrong. And so we're trying to make more relevant models for infection. What, what kind of models do you use at the moment? So we've been looking at some um, models that people use to study wounding, so scratch assays where you have a monolayer of cells and you peel off, run a, a pipette or a rubber policeman down the middle so that you create this wound and, and the cells can migrate in and, and, and undergo some different um, changes to their, their biochemistry. And then we've also used we've been using the organotypic or what we call the raft tissue culture system which is the system that i learned in in craig meyer's lab where we really grow skin in the laboratory mm -hmm. um and it's a it's a very cool system because it recapitulates a, um, all of the differentiation we can actually make infectious virus particles although not very effectively that way but we can also study the biochemistry and the cell biology of infection looking at these um these um, these tissue culture models. And then one of the things that we've been trying to do, so, I mean, one of the difficulties that's been lifelong in trying to study human papillomaviruses is that there are no good animal models that, that really recapitulate anogenital infection. And we've been using um, a rhesus macaque model um, to try and understand some of the questions that we were talking about earlier, like what cells in the genital tract are infected, what's the immune response to the virus getting in under, you know, more normal um, situation, um, you know, how how what are all the cytokines expressed that are you know presented there and and all of those sorts of things so right. 
trying to so get. So those, those are macaques infected with human papillomaviruses? No, there's actually a rhesus papillomavirus. There are at least probably 10 monkey papillomaviruses that have been characterized to date. Um, and um, so one of the viruses, the virus that's best characterized is rhesus papillomavirus type 1. And, and it seems to have sort of an epidemiology and um, a clinical presentation that looks very similar to anogenital or to cervical and, and penile transmission in rhesus macaques. And so it it looks like it would be a really good model of of initial infection of looking at it with SIV and it, in sort of an AIDS HIV context in in trying to understand it with um, uh, other sexually transmitted infections as well. So do those infections uh, progress to cancer in the macaques? So the original um, observation was from a male monkey who had a lymph node metastasis. Um, and this is where the RHPV1 genome was cloned. And when they went back to look at his cohort of the females that he had been um, mated with, they found very high um, um, concordance with that virus also being present in those females and, and lesser in, in females that were, you know, in the same colony but not... Um, um, some of his cohorts. So um, it looks it looks like that. It looks like it causes the same spectrum of disease all the way up to um, cervical cancer. How closely related is that virus to HPV 16 and 18? Um, it's, it's actually um, branches um, phylogenetically pretty close to those. Um, it's close to, to 16. 18 is a little bit farther away. Um, and it has oncoproteins that are also transforming. It has some aspects of RNA um, expression that are very closely aligned with those of other oncogenic um, papillomaviruses. So it shares a lot of the same physiology um, and, and molecular biology that these other um, viruses have. So it's possible that um, some HPV 16 or 18 ancestor infected the common ancestor of humans and macaques. Exactly. I mean, that's the idea. I mean, they've, they've found them in cyno monkeys and, and um, I think maybe in some orangutans. So it looks like these, these viruses have been with us and with mammals for a really long time. So it's an expensive model, right? It is a very expensive model. <laughs> yes, my grant reviewers always point that out. Yes. <laughs> is there a mouse papillomavirus you could use instead so there there is a new mouse papillomavirus that's been that's been characterized and there's not a lot of details on it but there's really i mean no, the the major answer to that is no there's no good rodent model for papillomavirus that does um you know that has some of these same characteristics now um john schiller's group at the nih has has made um a really nice what they call a vaginal challenge model in the um, rodent genital tract, where you can look at um, virus infection, and so you can you can look at the immune response and the antibody eliciting neutralizing antibodies, and and look at the the first types of of levels of infection. But you don't get a permissive infection, and you can't use it to look at progression to malignancy. This, this is using HPV, right? This is using HPV. Has, yeah. So I guess no one's looked in wild mice for. For mouse papillomaviruses, right? You know, my understanding is that a, that there have been a number of people that have looked, and it's just it has been not there. Hmm. So, I mean, and it's not. We we do have some. Um, there is a there is a rabbit oral papillomavirus, and you can force it to cause um, genital um, infections at at very high titers, and and it has some characteristics, but it doesn't look like an anogenital type is is really prevalent in the rodent population. Mm. Okay. I wonder if anybody's uh, looked using the more modern sequencing techniques. You know, I th I think a lot of people have looked. Yeah. Um. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've seen a lot of posters at different meetings, and and certainly you can find papillomaviruses. I mean, there are papillomaviruses and manatees and 
uh, you know, a number. And that's of not going to be. Animals. That's not going to be cheaper than macaques. Uh, <laughs> manatees. <laughs> yeah, but so there are definitely viruses out there. It, it lo- seems like the cutaneous ones are certainly easier to find, um, but those. All of the cutaneous papillomavirus types, whether in animals or humans, make a lot more virus than the anogenital ones. So the lesions are much smaller in the genital tract um, and in the head and neck region and, and than they are in, in the cutaneous skin. Hmm. So are there papillomaviruses of invertebrates? Mm. Oh, I'm trying to think, you know, the only the only other ones that I can think of is I think people have found them in snakes and birds, and I don't think that there have been any that go lower than that. So the okay. old myth about touching frogs and getting warts is totally... <laughs> Sorry, I just anyway. thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, that's funny. I actually used a, car- a Dennis the Menace cartoon about that in, in one of my um, presentations recently because... Yeah. And even Dennis knew that that was. Uh-huh. But yeah. apropos of uh, Dixon's comment, this is a virus. This is a, a virus family where uh, they they don't cross species barriers very readily. Correct at all, really at all. I mean, and that that has been a difficulty in studying them. But I mean, there was only a couple of instances where you have any of the animal papillomaviruses crossing a species, and there are some cow. Um, species that have been put into horses, and but they don't cause permissive infections. So these are very, very host-specific um, pathogens. I was just searching uh, PubMed for invertebrate papillomavirus, <laughs> and I came up with a report from 2009 of a papillomavirus in the gonad tissues of oysters. Oysters wow. again. Wow. You know? <laughs> Oysters. Yeah, they, they uh, say, I bet uh, you it's an accidental finding. <laughs> Filter feeders, come on. <laughs> from uh, the manatees, yeah. that comes yeah. from the manatees, I'm sure. Maybe. Probably. <laughs> anyway, for people swimming, for crying out. Here, here. Could be. Too bad the name molluscum contagiosum was already taken. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's another show, by the way. <laughs> uh, shall we go and do some emails, folks? We shall. Sure. Unfortunately for me, You're I'm going to have us? to bow out. I have a. Um, a 4.30 appointment, so All right. I'm sorry that I have to say goodbye, but I give you my pick of the week all in right. advance, and Vince can tell you all about it. Michelle, it's delightful talking with you, by the way. I, I Terrific talking to you, too. Love Thanks. to know more about what you're doing. Excellent. Okay. Bye, Dixon. See Bye, Dixon. See you, Take guys. Care. All right. The first email today is from Aaron, who writes, I'm a chemical engineer by background. And I've done downstream process development in biopharma for years. Just lately, I've started working on a part-time biomasters. I've been taking all the standard cell molecular bio classes I never had before. I'm about to start a course on biology of HIV AIDS. And I've been using your back episodes to fortify my meager background in general virology. Thanks so much. Here's my question. One of the primary phenomena I work on is chemistry and physics in the freeze-concentrated state of frozen protein solutions. When you freeze ice crystals out of an aqueous solution, the remaining excipients concentrate in interstitial space like a Slurpee. This gives you the opposing kinetics of high concentration at low temperature, which can lead to different chemistry than in the liquid state. All this RNA talk raises a question I've thought about for a while. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the Miller-Urey abiogenesis reflux experiments and some of the follow-up work showing that amino acids can be synthesized from water, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen. Some follow-on experiments seem to show that the original frozen samples from this experiment formed even more amino acids when stored frozen for decades, possibly due to decomposition of some precursors formed in the original experiment. Additional work has shown that all four nucleotides can be synthesized from long-term freezing of aqueous cyanide compounds. I found some other articles that say freeze concentration is favorable for extracellular RNA polymerization and for the spontaneous assembly of polynucleotides from precursors. All of this points to the idea that the primordial cell-like environment in which life first evolved was the interstitial spaces of freeze concentrate in dirty ice. It makes sense to me because freeze concentration is one of the few natural phenomena 
that dramatically reduce local entropy in a concentrated liquid. I've never heard of this idea before in my bio courses. Is cryo-abiogenesis a common part of the RNA world hypothesis? Are there other major problems with this theory I am unaware of? Looking at these papers, it seems like primordial freeze concentration is the best explanation out there for the initial formation of organized biomacromolecules. But if this is so, I'm surprised I've never heard of it before. Any thoughts? Well, my thought on reading this was um, probably the reason you haven't heard of it before is because maybe there haven't been a lot of chemical engineers um, with your background working on this problem. (laughs) Because it sounds to me like a very reasonable hypothesis um, that, uh, you know, you could have had freezing in some areas of the early Earth. And uh, this description of what happens in the the sort of frozen concentrated state um, makes perfect sense. And... Yeah, I would think that could have been part of the process. I have this preconception that the early Earth is pretty hot. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's one of that's one of my problems with it. But of course, I don't know anything. I don't know about the you know the sort of geology or the global climate of the Earth, its history relative to when life was thought to uh, come around. Well, what I'm thinking is um, at very deep depths in the ocean. Um, you could have had much colder temperatures. Um, now, I don't know whether ice crystals would have formed there or whether there would have been some other physics going on under, under all that pressure. Um, but I I don't know. I think you'd have to ask a, a geologist about that. This guy's uh, head is certainly in an interesting place. I mean, it's a really interesting idea. I look, it is. I looked at a variety of um, papers that deal with abiogenesis and really they don't really deal with the the frozen hypothesis so i think you're onto something novel here yeah yeah and i i just saw an article recently about um this uh, another analysis of the original uh, miller urey specimens and now people are using more sensitive techniques and they're finding um even more um uh, i guess it was just a pnas paper that came out um that uh, they they found twenty three amino acids. So apparently, um, all his fr- all his samples were frozen. Yeah, and they're yeah, still so he froze all of his samples. So it's possible that those amino acids were there in the first place, and that um, and that they're now just detecting them because we've got much, much more sensitive techniques. But it's also possible that the freezing allowed them to produce more of these amino acids. Mm. I really like the idea that his experiment is still going on in the freezer. Yes. So yeah. the the authors, um, let's see, uh, primordial synthesis of amines, et cetera, um, Jeffrey Bada at uh, um, UCSD uh, in La Jolla is the senior author on that one. Um, so I would say, yeah, maybe you ought to drop a line to, uh, to Dr. Bada. <laughs> sure. Send this email his way, and uh, and you may have a collaboration yeah, out of it. That's a good idea. Uh, the next one's from Lillian, who writes, referring to episode 125 and XMRV contamination. My question about contamination is, if it is so common via cell lines, reagents, etc., why are there so many XMRV studies that found no evidence of XMRV either in controls or cases? It would seem that if contamination were a recurrent common issue, many studies would find some positives, even if a low number, equally in cases and controls. Of course, this might get down to the nitty-gritty of the exact cell lines, reagents, PCR primers, what experiments the lab had performed in the past, and even what experiments the authors had done in the past, and thus what they were exposed to, etc. But these issues should be explored rather than just hand-waving explanations that with positive studies, the cases, blood samples were handled more than the controls, or that these labs have been contaminated. I think she's pretty much answered her own question there. She's got uh, she's got all of the all of the possibilities in there, and I would say from from my understanding is that uh, there uh, people are actually doing controlled studies now to try and sort all this out, so that we don't have to wave our hands anymore. Exactly. Yeah. There's um, there there's one of the big ones going on now is the one Ian Lipkin is running. Um, that should sort out exactly these issues? I think it's a good question. It's one of the reasons why I don't think we should put a lid on this yet, because we should sort out why Mm -hmm. certain people got certain answers and others got different ones. 
Absolutely. And uh, I do believe that in the next few weeks we will get some more results along these lines, so stay tuned. Next one is from Bob Krug, a virologist west of the Mississippi in Austin, Texas. I guess that's not too far from you, Michelle, although right. not too far is probably thousands of miles. We're talking Texas here. <laughs> yeah. <Yes>. You know. <laughs> The uh, the uh, east end of Texas, when you enter on I-10, is exit something like 888. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh. Bob writes, Hi, Vince. I enjoyed your podcast at the University of Washington. Several people here brought it to my attention. I just wanted to tell you one thing. I was not the second nasty reviewer of your paper. <laughs> All right. So I'm... I'm <laughs> I had said at that podcast, I, when I was a graduate student, I thought he had reviewed one of my papers, and he's he's not. So publicly, I'm saying, you're you're right, Bob, you're not. I'm sorry I impugned you. <laughs> you I never didn't... know. You can make up a lot of stories about reviewers in there. I know. You know, long. I didn't think he would hear it, to be honest. <laughs> you think that he really remembers it correctly? That's the question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> sorry, Bob. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, the next so one. we could say just definitively that Bob denies being the second reader. Yes, yeah. that's correct. I shouldn't have mentioned it at all, actually. I was sort of joshing. joshing but Well, I think the, he is, too. Yeah. So. Uh, the next one's from Brian. On a number of TWIV podcasts, you've mentioned... Wait a minute. Did you finish his letter? I didn't really, no. Bob continues, I think you would enjoy holding a podcast here at UT Austin. People here would enjoy it. In particular, I think that you would enjoy meeting with two young virologists here, Sarah Sawyer. And Chris Sullivan. All right. We're on, we're on our way. We're packing our bags. We're happy to go. Hey, those guys are great, too. I've interacted with both of them. Oh, yeah? and, and I think you would have a good time with well, them. Why don't, yeah. you, why don't you come when we go there and you can join would us? would love to. Well. It's not too far. You can just drive, right? <laughs> you know, Austin is the only place that's really... Oh, I shouldn't say that. Never mind. You're going to get... Yeah, you're going to get emails. It's, it's my Texas But I hear place. Austin is a nice place, right? Vincent, I'm going to be I'm going to be in the area for almost three weeks in June. This summer? Yeah. Yeah, it's too hot in the summer, isn't it? Uh, well, depends on your perspective. It's not that <laughs> bad, and Austin is a great city. It's really fun, and Chris would Chris Sullivan would definitely show everyone a good time. Right. We can go see the bats. That's right. That's right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Bob. We'll we'll do that. Uh, next one's from Brian. On a number of TWIV podcasts, you've mentioned the quasi-species concept. In one podcast, Alan or Rich said something about having to look into that concept more closely. I assume this involves more than the elementary definition. <laughs> I think that's good. Steps Toward Life by Manfred, Manfred Eigen, Ruthild Winkler, Oswatish, Paul Woolley provides, among other things, a rather concise vignette of the quasi-species concept for those of us who need the elementary approach. In addition, the authors provide scenarios for the beginnings of life from organic matter, inorganic matter, less than perfect replication and compartments. And if that's not enough, there is a fascinating treatment of viral evolution, positing that viruses replicate their genetic material with enough error and enough accuracy that they sit at the edge of thermodynamic dissolution while having the maximum flexibility for adaptation. I have no formal background in microbiology other than a reading of the third edition of the Molecular Biology of the Cell by Albert et al. Now it's time to buy the fifth edition to catch up with the last 20 years. That said, I have little trouble following the discussion. I do have a question. I'm in my early 60s, have time and enough money so I don't have to work much. Is there any place in virology or parasitology for amateur participation? Thank you so much for the podcast and for TWIP as well. I would say absolutely. <clears throat> Go to a university, uh, ask around, or look at you know look at the jobs list. You know, start off by washing dishes if you can stand it. Okay, that's how a lot of people, uh, am amateurs or undergraduates, uh, uh, start off and just kind of get into the whole lab scene. Ask it. You know, as long as you're interested and you're enthusiastic, it's not that difficult to learn. And uh, uh, people are, especially volunteers, people are happy to have volunteers around. I totally agree with that. That's great. This is uh, Brian, who originally sent Dixon. A, he was in Switzerland, and he sent what he called the Swiss Vertical Farm. It was a picture of a cow at a very high altitude on a mountainside, and it was, <laughs> it was, it was a very steep slope. And he said this is the Swiss equivalent of a vertical farm. It was pretty funny. All right, our last one. 
is from David. It's David at NYU, who's a professor at NYU. I was listening to your latest podcast, interesting and informative as always, and thought you might find a few additional items of interest. First, you discussed in Ode to a Plaque the wonderful mechanisms that viruses use to move from cell to cell and wondered if there were other examples. Here's a paper you might want to discuss. Biofilm-like extracellular viral assemblies mediate HTLV-1 cell-to-cell transmission at virological synapses. So this is a very interesting paper, and I put it on our agenda to talk about in a future TWIV. It's, it's about how infected cells produce virions of HTLV-1, but they, they get stuck right on the cell surface, and then they're transferred en masse to another susceptible cell. Rather yeah, this than, is really cool. Rather than diffusing. Uh, another item you discussed, the PAC-Bio sequencing system, a very clever nanotechnology method for ultra-high throughput sequencing. There's another technology that just came on the market that also uses very clever nanochemistry, the ion torrent system, now sold by Life Technology. It uses semiconductor technology to build tiny pH-sensitive chambers, each one containing a single synthesizing DNA molecule, and then detects the addition of each nucleotide by the change in pH caused by the release of a proton when the nucleotide triphosphate is hydrolyzed during incorporation. And that way it doesn't require any special reagents such as fluorescent labeled nucleotides or fancy cameras, but just uses normal nucleotides and polymerase, which should result in reduced costs. Like the PAC bio system, they are still trying to optimize read length and accuracy, but it's a pretty clever idea. Jeez, I wonder if the pH change is different for different bases or if they're having to feed them bases one at a time. Yeah, that's a good question. But I'll bet it costs just as much. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, all these next generations uh, sequencing systems are, um, they're the kind of thing that you would would send your DNA sample out to a lab that has this equipment. You would not buy it and set it on your bench. Finally, you discussed the difficulties of conducting vaccine trials in humans. You may want to check out the work of John Trainer at University of Rochester, who conducts flu virus trials in volunteers who are quarantined for 10 days following exposure to attenuated viruses and provide daily nasal swabs to watch the replication and ultimate clearance of the viruses. Wow. I guess they use attenuated strains, yes. Yeah. (laughs) All right, well, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. That's pretty interesting. It's popular among college students who can make a couple of thousand dollars by participating. Geez, I did stuff like that as a graduate student. Yeah? Really? Great to be a guinea pig. My wife did uh, a couple of studies like that when she was in medical school. It was so, like a weekend, you know, when you spend a weekend in some, you know, hospital. Hospital, yeah. Yeah, nice, nice, nice hospital uh, wing and, uh, you know, I did that actually stuff. with Mary Estes when they were trying to discover what was what they now know is the Norwalk virus. Oh, so they, you did that? They, they gave us virus, which I didn't know at the time was from purified stool samples. And then they, You were part of that one. Oh, that's I awesome. I was. But you know what? I was one of two people who didn't get sick. Lucky you. Yeah. What's, is, that, uh, do you have, is this a blood type thing? I can't remember. It's like some enzymatic thing, but whenever I go back, they make me chew up parafilm and spit into a, into a <laughs> tube. So right. I need to follow up on it. But yeah, it was hideous, though, listening to how sick everybody else was in the hospital. Yeah, when Skip Virgin was here recently, he talked about that study, and he said it was timed so the medical students could go back to school on Monday. Yeah, it was nice. <laughs> Our last one is from Jim who writes, your interest in information organization and display prompts me to send this link, which is useful with the current public interest in the topic of radiation exposure. This is a very cool graph. Yeah. It's interesting to me as a retired nuclear power plant worker, too. We were just converting from REM to sieverts as I retired, and this link helps in that regard. 5 REM is the current federal standard maximum allowed exposure for a nuclear worker. You can see what that equates to in sieverts at this site. So this is a very nice graphic, which basically tells you the amount of exposure you get. You know, a mammogram, um, EPA yearly release limit for a nuclear power plant. It does it in a graphic way, which uh, is very nice. Yeah, so, this is um, this is the same um, guy 
the the guy who generated this graph is the fellow who does the XKCD web comic. Ah, oh, um, okay, which is a lot of fun. I didn't. So know you that. can get you can get nuked by sleeping next to someone. Sure. Point point oh five micro sieverts. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So did you pick this once, uh, Alan? I think you did. I picked I picked XKCD. Yeah. The the web comic. Okay. Very um, good. But yeah, this this fellow has a obviously has a way with images. That's very good. That's very cool. Well, that brings us to our picks of the week. And um, Michelle, did you have a pick that you wanted to share with us? I do have one, but now I really like this biofilm thing, although it's a little bit older. Um, but my pick of the week was is in cell host and microbe. It's HIV uses the CXCR4 chemokine receptor to infect multipotent hemopoietic stem cells and progenitor cells. Yeah. So, Who's the senior author on that, by the way? That looks like Kathleen Collins. She's going to be on TWIV in a couple of weeks. Oh, that's great. Yeah. This she's, is an interesting story. Yeah, that's great. Perfect. And people yeah. can read it before before she comes on. That'll be good. Yeah, I just saw that a, a bit. And in fact, I had asked her to be on uh, around the same time I asked you. And um, then the paper came out. Excellent. So that's cool. Uh, Dixon left me his... And this is a New York Times article entitled Bangladesh Bans the Sale of Palm Sap. And so Palm Sap is one way that Nipah virus is transmitted. So in Bangladesh, people collect palm sap and they store it and the bats like to drink it. So they go at night and drink it and they defecate and excrete virus into the sap. And then when people drink it, they get infected with Nipah. So uh, the government says you can't sell it anymore. So interesting short article. I don't know if that will matter, if people will listen. What do I do with palm sap? Do I eat it? Uh, Alan, what do you do with palm sap? I am not exactly sure. I'm now skimming through this. <laughs> palm uh, sap. Oh, Let's... Bangladeshis like drinking yeah. date Ooh. palm sap. It's yeah. Uh, uh, oh, it's gathered like maple for, syrup. <clears throat> ferment Sweet. into wine. Okay. But it obviously doesn't kill the virus. No. Right. Well, they can't. The Muslims can't drink alcohol, so they would just drink it neat. Ah, uh, right. Not non-fermented. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Right. Fermentation might kill it, but the, so this uh, is a, an example of won't. how low tech can sometimes help prevent the spread of infectious diseases. Rich, what do you have for us? I have a pick within a pick that I thought of just as we went on. As oh, classic! Topic appropriate. First of all, the the uh, outer shell of the pick is uh, a book by Lewis Thomas called "The Medusa and the Snail." And let me just tell you very briefly about Lewis Thomas. Uh, he was born in 1913, died in 1993. A physician, poet, etymologist, essayist, administrator, educator, policy advisor, and researcher. He attended Princeton and Harvard Medical School. He was the dean of Yale Medical School and New York University School of Medicine, also the president of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Institute. So this is a guy with creds, okay? And he was a brilliant essayist. Absolutely. He just in his, one of these guys with boundless energy and in his spare time uh, wrote essays and he published a couple of books. This is one of them, The Medusa and the Snail. Um, I chose this primarily because of an, uh, one of the essays in the book is called On Warts. Okay. <gasps> Fabulous. Do you know this, I don't. I can't wait to oh, hear it. <laughs> oh, oh, this is amazing. And uh, uh, there's actually, there's a, there, you can, I gave a link so that you can actually read this online. It's a very short essay. It's really easy to read. He talks about some experiments that were done uh, uh, quite a while ago. Uh, that uh, I don't know whether to say suggest or show, I haven't seen the primary data, that you can get rid of warts by hypnosis. So okay? that, you know, I've heard um, some studies of that before, and it goes into the whole neuroimmunology exactly. area, right? Exactly. Which As, I think is okay. really fascinating. Right. So, so Thomas basically cites that as background and then spins off about what must be going on if his subconscious can manipulate his immune system, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just 
wild. Uh, it's a wonderful essay. I think the the observation is interesting to start with, and Thomas's spin on it uh, shows the really the creative mind of a scientist going to work on this. It's really great. That's great. I can't wait to read that. Cool. Oh. Yeah, I like Lewis Thomas. I got all his books. It's great. It's good stuff. He was an underachiever, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow. poor guy yeah. alan uh well my pick of the week is a uh, website called planting science um and this is a site that's been set up uh well it's a whole effort um that's been set up to coordinate um students and teachers uh, like high school middle school students and teachers who are in science classes with scientists who volunteer as mentors um, now, unfortunately, they're primarily looking for botanists, and I'm not one. Um, but I think there, perhaps there are some listening to this show, and they'd like to get on board with this. Or there, uh, I know we have some teachers who listen, and they might want to get their classes into this. Um, the neat thing here is the uh, the science students um, in high school or whatever will um, actually, I guess, a lot of them are middle schools here. Um, they set up an experiment and design it and they get input from their their volunteer mentor online um and then they proceed through the experiment and monitor what they're doing and they're doing plant experiments because obviously you know you don't need irb approval or an animal use committee or anything like that so it's a good system for kids to work on um and they can, they're looking at all sorts of, I mean, there's some fairly typical what's the effect of uh, fertilizer type of stuff, but then there's, uh, um, you know, different, uh, different analyses of life cycles of different um, plants and all this sort of stuff, uh, enriched CO2 le levels. Um, so ranging from very simple to moderately sophisticated and all with this this constant feedback and input from um, from actual plant scientists, Excellent. and I think it's I think it's a really cool approach to science education. That's that's great. Yeah, I like that very much because you could imagine this being done in in all sorts of areas. Yeah, engaging experts. Michelle, do you teach undergrads there? Um, you know, I don't anymore. I've done a couple of lectures in virology, but I really love getting researchers, undergraduate researchers in the lab. Because mm. like you said, I mean, that's how I started out. And that's how I fell in love with virology was washing dishes and stuffing yeah. pipette boxes. So, yeah. yeah, this is good stuff. Yeah. Well, my pick is something I've been using for a long time, and i surprised that I haven't picked it before. It's the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Poli Policy, also known as SIDRAP. It's a website uh, set up by the University of Minnesota. Now, they are charged with uh, addressing public health preparedness and responses to inf emerging infectious diseases, but I find it's a wonderful place to go for, for a summary of information on various outbreaks and so forth. So they have a you can sign up for various email alerts, and you can get a daily or a weekly summary of everything that's going on in vaccines, H1N1 influenza, um, smallpox, plague, botulism, anthrax, whatever you're interested in. So nice. I, I've signed up for some virus alerts, and you get – they have very good summaries every week of stories and research that's going on, and they also do some of their own writing as well, so – I would definitely check it out. I highly recommend it. And as I said, you can go sign up for some email alerts and, and customize them to what you want. They have BSE, SARS, West Nile, monkeypox, chemical terrorism, really cool stuff. I just signed up to follow them on Twitter. Very good. They're funded by the 3M Foundation and the 3M Company in support of communicating and emerging infectious disease information. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great. And there you go. That's another TWIV. Before we wrap up, I want to remind everyone, we put up a poll on whether you think we should destroy the last remaining stocks of smallpox over at Virology Blog. It was after we had our last episode. And so far, we have 75% in favor of keeping the stocks and 25% in favor of destroying them. It's around 300 people responding. 
you suppose the World Health Organization is uh, monitoring this poll? No, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, uh, s someone well, wrote... but it's so well controlled and scientific. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> so here's the thing, though. Someone wrote in the comments, and this is a very good comment. It's not a good poll because everyone who visits my blog is interested in viruses. Yeah. So, right. and they said, well, you should make a broader poll. So I said, ah, you know, I know a journalist at USA Today. So I emailed him and I said, how would you like to run this poll on your website? Can you imagine if they ran it, they would get, you know, hundreds of thousands of responses and it would be from a very broad audience. So we'll, we'll see if he uh, does it. That would Great. be good. So don't forget, we are on Facebook, facebook.com slash This Week in Virology, our little fan page there. You can find us on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace and either way, you can subscribe and automatically get episodes. You can listen at twiv.tv, where you, we also have show notes and our letters and so forth. And if you go to microbeworld.org slash app, you can purchase for four ninety nine an app which will stream Twiv and all our other podcasts to your iDevice or your Android device. And again, send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. Michelle, thanks for coming. Thank you so much. This was great. Always fun. And we're glad to have someone west of the Mississippi. Well, I'm glad to be your poster child today. Very good. <laughs> University of New, of New Mexico in Albuquerque, where she's wearing flip-flops. That's right. And we're not because this morning it snowed here. Yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> Dixon de Pommier, who's left, is at verticalfarm.com. Alan Dove, thank you. Always a pleasure. AlanDove.com. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida. Thank you, Rich. You're quite welcome. I always, I always enjoy this. Home of the Gators. And I am Vincent Racaniello at Virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.